how important is it for you to to be part of the Toronto Film Festival with the Invisible, considering that the last time we saw a Equatorian film at the festival was maybe, I think, 20 years ago. So it's a big responsibility in a way. Uh, hi, good morning. Yeah, um, well, it is. It's the first time we had there's an Ecuadorian film playing at TIFF in 17 years. Last movie, the last movie was Sebastián Cordero's Crónicas. Uh, it is, it is a, a big responsibility, but we're trying not to think about it too much. We're trying to yeah. more think about the impact that the movie will have, hopefully, on audiences and critics alike, and also on our experience here, which has been uh, so far great. So I'm trying to run <laughs> from responsibility as much so, as I can. So the Toronto Film Festival is uh, not only an incredible platform, but a very yeah. welcoming one, right? In yeah, a great yeah. market to in a wonderful market. Could you comment on those aspects, please? Well, for us, it's uh, the, the, you've described it quite rightly. Uh, we had our first screening yesterday and the response of the crowd was very, very positive. And we felt they really connected with the movie. This is a movie that's, I think, has some very challenging aspects. So it was very interesting to see that the audiences are very adventurous and cultured and, and are into the film. Uh, on that side. On the market side, of course, to get attention and to get, uh, you know, it's a very crowded marketplace, particularly now because uh, of, of streamers and because we're spending so much time at home with COVID and so on and so forth. So it's, I guess it's particularly complicated to try and distinguish oneself with a project, but it seems to start happen to, that that's starting to happen for us. And that makes us again, very happy. We you know, we, we cannot, we can only do the film we made. I mean, we only made, you know, we made the film we made. So we are very happy to share it. And we hope it will connect with people uh, on an industry level, on a market level, um, that, and, that, and that it will find, you know, a broader home. Why explore, why exploring postpartum trauma, depression, or the impact yeah. of having a baby? Why? Um, that... That originated with the idea of uh, dealing with depression in, a, in cinema. I was trying to figure out a way to make a movie uh, about depression, which is a subject that's very close to me, very dear to my heart, uh, for, you know, just because of personal stuff. But I didn't want it to be, uh, I really wanted it to be from a feminine point of view. So when Anaï Honeysen, who's the co-writer and the star of the film came into the project, it allowed me to explore it uh, from a very specifically uh, feminine side. And that led us to postpartum depression. What would be more specifically feminine than postpartum depression? So that, that combination of things, this desire of dealing with depression in film and Anais presence as a sort of catalyzer or as a, as a, as, as a co-writer created the film that you see now. Is a depression the invisible uh, illness? <laughs> a little, right? Well, that's one of the possible readings of the films, of the film, yeah, we were toying with that. We were also toying with the idea of loneliness and the idea of just being unable to, to fit in a world that used to, uh, uh, to, that used to function for the main character. So what we decided to dramatize was the return from a psychiatric place to an environment that it's no longer hers. And we decided to ponder the question in cinema through images and sounds of what does it feel like to not belong where you once belong? And what does it feel like to not love what you're supposed to love? Maybe she misses the past, but the past is gone and it's not, never going to come back. Yep, you got it, you got it. I mean. All these ideas that really came from literature uh, were lingering around us when we were writing. And the challenge was to try and write it in a way that would be sort of concrete enough for a narrative, for a film narrative, but also sort of uh, metaphorical enough for the audience to start having its own dialogue with the film and with the depiction of illness that the film makes. Um, so Javier, we need to introduce the film with your comment. So if you can okay. tell us a little 
Lo Invisible, o oh, The Invisible, es mm -hmm. un film about, and then let us know, and then we'll use your narration to describe it. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, Lo Invisible is the story of Luisa, who's a middle-aged woman from a very wealthy family in Ecuador. And the film follows her return from a psychiatric place to uh, her, home, her house, a very beautiful, very sort of commanding place that starts to eerily and weirdly resembling, resemble a cage of sorts. And the movie ponders a question, how long would she be able to stay in this sort of cage with golden bars uh, of what used to be her house and her life? Ooh. And uh, Rosita, the character of Rosita, she yeah. symbolizes, I guess, her childhood. Yep, or she's been going back nanny to her whole life, yep. I love that lady. She's a well-known actress, right? She's fantastic, or Matilde. No, she, we found her for the film. Actually, Anai found her for this film. We wrote her and we really liked the character. And then we were very worried that we would never maybe find somebody with the characteristics that we needed. But Anai uh, sort of took it upon herself to do the casting of certain characters of the film. And she went, this is an interesting story, she went downtown to the center of Quito and found a center for sort of senior citizens who are interested in art. So Matilde was part of a sort of uh, senior citizens uh, dance troupe. And, um, and Anai found her there and offered her the part. She made a, an audition and she was fantastic. And we were all sort of in love with her from then on. So yeah, she's- She was great, she was great. She's and, the secret uh, what of the about, movie. Do you think that postpartum syndrome has to do with, uh, no, maybe not, but being part of the ruling class, that she, she has the luxury of getting depressed when, because she has so much, She's part of the dominant class. I don't know if she's, you know. I know. I, I think I know what you mean. What we, it depends on the character. To me, it really always depends on the character. So once we created Luisa and decided that this was going to be the world where Luisa lived and that we were going to explore depression through her journey in the movie, it, the ways to dramatize that depression had everything to do with her class and her position. Because if, if you're like, say, like me, I'm a film teacher who makes movies on the side and, and I have a baby, I cannot afford to ignore the baby. But she yeah. could. And, and that seemed very interesting to us in terms of the, I guess, the conveying, conveying a narrative that dealt with that subject with her, you know what I mean? Like I, totally. I, I cannot ignore my kid. I, I actually have a four-year-old kid and, and I could never, we had it, we, imagine that in the COVID, we had to take care of him and it became a thing on its own. But Luisa could suddenly go ahead and be depressed. And we figured that would be a more particular movie following a character like her uh, in this world. Yeah, 